Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done. I ask that your spirit would be upon me and us, Lord, as we delve into your word and, 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 and seek the deep things of God, Lord, so that we can see how far your love came to actually reach us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So I want you guys to turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 3. And we're going to start from the top. Here we find that Nicodemus is talking to Jesus, and then Jesus is explaining to him that in order for a person to actually to enter into the kingdom of heaven, he must be born again. John chapter 3, verse 1, and it says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Then Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, how can a man be, bo be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered and said, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the, of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind blows where it listeth, or th and thou hearest the sound thereof. But thou canst not tell whence it comes and whither it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? So let me stop right there, give a quick um, overview. So here, Nicodemus, he doesn't quite understand or claims to understand what Jesus is talking about. Jesus says, you've got to be born again to enter to the kingdom of God. So you have to be born of the water and then also of the spirit. Now, some would consider being baptized here is, the, is what he's talking about. But quite literally, he meant like being born like literally from your mother's womb, where, of course, your mother, the the woman, her water breaks, and then you kind of come out eventually. So you have to be born, of course, first, and then born again uh, uh, later in, your, in the spirit or in, in your mind. So this should be a simple concept. Very simple. Very earthly, actually. Then he tells him this. Verse 11. Verily, verily, I say unto you, we speak that we know and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. So here Jesus gets even deeper. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus alone, and he says, we speak about the things that we have seen and testify of the things that we have heard, and you have not received our witness. Jesus gets even deeper. He says, if I have told you earthly things, which means everything he just said before this with earthly things, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? So he's like, look, everything I just told you are just, is earthly already. It's pretty earth, and you don't understand the science of that. Now, if I was to tell you some heavenly things, things that are beyond you're not going to understand that either. Now, he demonstrates this, and the whole, I believe the whole world throughout history, just, this went over their head. Now, watch this. Now, you would catch this more in the King James Version because the King James Version kept, kind of decided to keep this manuscript of the verse, while other translations kind of left this manuscript out. But here, Jesus goes on and says, if I have, no, verse 13, he says, And no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Boom. Most people just, just read over this verse and just, get, keep, just going, keep going and say, oh, how nice. Well, let me just keep on reading so I can get to King, uh, John 3, 16, you know, everyone's favorite verse. But this verse is so extremely just mysterious because here... We see 
Jesus is talking to Nicodemus where? He's on earth, talking to Nicodemus. And then he also says, no one came down, ascended up to heaven, but he that came down, which is Jesus, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Now, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus on earth, and he also claims that the Son is in heaven right now at the same time. How is that possible that Jesus is in heaven and also on earth? Now, some would try to speculate and say, well, he's there through the Spirit. But Jesus could say that in other words. He could say that I'm, I'm there through the Spirit, he, but he didn't say that. He said the Son. He could have said, well, I'm there because the Father and I am in the Father. But he didn't say I'm there because of the Father. He said the Son. Now, how is this possible? Let me ask you this question. Is Jesus above time? Yes. How do we know that? Turn with me to to, uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. And for those who don't have their Bibles, Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, it says this. Jesus speaks, and he says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, which is, which was, and which is to come. Now, this is pretty clear in Greek and in English. Jesus says, I am the Alpha, which means, you know, the first letter of the Greek alphabet, or he's, he's basically saying, I am the A, and I'm also the Z. I am the beginning, and I am also the end. Notice that there's a conjunction here. In other words, he's both at the same time. So, let me see this. So this would probably be, since we often read from the, I guess we we start from the right, I mean from the left to to the right, okay. So this, let's say this is the omega, the end. Now this is the beginning of time. Jesus, he's here and he's also here. You get that? So, since Jesus is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, Jesus at the end can easily walk anywhere throughout time, go to even the time when he was on earth, and look at himself talking to Nicodemus. That way, he can be in heaven and on earth at the same time. Now, let's, let, me dig that, let, let me dig a little deeper. Now, the reason why this is so relevant is because if you go throughout the Bible, there are some strange, mysterious paradoxes or contradictions some would con- consider. For example, Revelation chapter 17, verse 8, and this is speaking about uh, everyone that follows the beast, and it says, The beast that thou sawest what, sawest was and is not, and shall not ascend, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. It says, and they that dwell on the earth shall wander, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. Now, stop right there. It says that their names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. So in the beginning of the world... Their names were not there from the beginning. So it's as though God predestined them to be lost. And this, this verse, you know, you know uh, our Calvinist friends, they, they like to jump on this verse and say, you see, God damned some people to go to hell and, damned, and, and actually he blessed some people to go to heaven from the very beginning. So it doesn't matter what you've done in your life. If God wants you to go to hell, you can't do nothing about it. And they have this distorted picture of God. And then also they would say, well, you, if, it doesn't matter what kind of sinner you are. It doesn't matter whether you choose Christ or you reject him. You're going to heaven if God wants you. If, if God has you in his book from the beginning, you're going to heaven. But that's not what the, t- the text or the entire Bible teaches. Now, if you go to Exodus 32 or other verses, uh, verse 33, God speaks about the books. And it says, and the Lord said unto Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. So get this. 
there's one verse that says, I will blot you out my book, as if he hasn't done it yet. Then there's another one that says, you weren't there in the first place. As if, like, like, like he blotted you out in the first place. Like, how does that happen? Here, how's it ha- this is how it happens. See, because Jesus is over time, and he has the book of life, he can be here in the Omega, the, the very beginning, or excuse me, the very end, and the book of life will have all the recordings of everyone's life. Everything you've done will be written in that book. And, of course, he sees that you've rejected Christ, you denied him, you either accepted him, whatever. He sees all that, and he has the book in his hands. But because he's God, he can walk out from his position and go all the way to the beginning, to the very alpha, or he can be talking to Adam with the same book that he had all the way from the future. And then the scripture would be, their names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Now, this is what I call the divine time paradigm. Basically, God is experiencing life or everything in three dimensions of time. Get this. Now, I want you to put your critical mind to work. The very top is something we call the now dimension. The now dimension is where everything is happening to God all at once. He is the great I am. He's he's here, there, everywhere, all at the same time. The past, present is all like one. Then, below that, something we call the Council of Peace. In, In other words, it's a place where God has his own timeline. He can... He can play with the sun, throw a football, and the, the sun can catch it and fall in, in a 30 B.C. <laughs> then he can throw it right back and catch it at the second coming. And they can play back and forth in time. And time is, is just irrelevant to them. They can just go back and forth. Then there's something called just temporality or just history, where the sun is only, or God himself, is only going forward in time. Just going forward. So he's just experiencing life forward just like we are. So if I can get my uh, three volunteers real quick. You stand here, and then you're going to be right here on the top. You're going to be walking back and forth, and you're going to be right behind everything. So God, in history, he's walking in time. And he just walks in time, and he, he just takes things as they come to him. So in other words, there's times when God seems like he don't know what's going to happen. So there's, this is the area where he has what we called conditional prophecies. You guys ever heard of that, those, uh, that concept, conditional prophecies? For example, if we go to like Jeremiah, Jeremiah 18, verse 7. He says, at one instance, I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And what instance I shall speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom to build and to plant. If it to do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good whereof I said I will re- benefit. So in other words, God says, look, if a nation that I pronounce judgment on turns from their evil ways, then I'm going to repent. So for example, remember the story of uh, Jonah where God told him, look, I'm going to destroy these people. And Jonah, he said, look, in 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. Oh, and behold, the people actually repented, which was a big surprise. They actually repented. So then guess what God did? He was going to judge them. He says, oh, they repented. So, uh, they, And then some would say, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. God, didn't you just tell him a prophecy? You said this will happen. But the thing is, he was working upon condition as though he did not know. It was like he was living with us in time. Now, here God talks that way. Then we're here, where God, he walks over time, and as he's walking over time, he can actually show us 
exactly what will happen. Not what might happen, but what will happen. Why? For example, the book of Revelation is not a conditional prophecy. It is a revelation of what will come to pass, not what might come to pass. You know, some theologians, they, they get themselves so tripped up into thinking that the book of Revelation is, well, you know, it's, it's God saying, trying to warn us. Well, yeah, he's trying to warn us individually, but the book of Revelation uh, is about God being in the future already, telling us what will come to pass. So, hey, be prepared to see it. <laughs> That's the difference. So God, he speaks in this mode where he, he, he's letting you know, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I'm there. Then he talks in this mode saying, look, I am with you. I'm going through time with you so that you understand that I feel your pain. So, for example, have you ever read in the scriptures where God, he repents or he regrets something? Now, doesn't that kind of confuse you sometimes? Like, you think, wait, God, don't you know everything? Don't you know the future? Why is it you talk as though you don't know? Now, it's very simple. Because in order for God to actually know everything, he has to know how it is to not know. Did I go over your head? Okay. God has to know how it is to not know. Let me ask you this question. Did Jesus know everything? I heard mixed answers there. <laughs> See, some said yes, some said no. But here, here's the thing. Jesus says that no man knows the day nor the hour except my Father, not even the angels nor the Son. So Jesus did not know his coming. How does, how does he not know his coming? See, what God did... He came down into our place and also in our time. And he just closed off all that he knows to know what is possible with man. So he did not know what the future holds. He didn't know completely. He had to do something that we have to do, which is trust, have faith, have hope. How can you have hope? If you know everything, Jesus could not be our leader in hope and in faith if he knew everything. He had a trust sometimes. He had a trust actually all the time. That's why Jesus put himself in this condition, and he was showing us this is how he is. Now, we have God here. He's, you know, he's the, the great I am. Now, turn with me in, your, in the Bible, in uh, Exodus 3.14, Exodus 3.14, where God speaks to Moses, and God says, he says, God said unto, unto Moses, just in case you want to take notes, he says, when Moses asked him, what should I call you when people um, ask you for your name, and God said unto him, unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am. This does not mean I will be, I was, I am. So the name is, his God, God's name is so big, so awesome, that there's no completion to this. It's I am for all eternity, past, present, and future. So, this has to do with time as well. Now, you might be wondering, so how do, how do you know that's, he might be just talking about, you know, being I am good, I am this, I am, but not time. Well, turn with me to John chapter 8, verse uh, uh, 50. And it says, and Jesus speaking, he says, I seek not my own glory, and there is no one that seeks and judge. Verse 51. Verily I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. 
Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead in the prophets. And thou sayest, If a man keeps my saying, he shall never taste of, taste, taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? The prophets are dead. Whom makest thou, thus, who makest thou thyself? Jesus answered and said, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honors me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. If I should say I know him, I shall be a liar. I mean, if I say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his sayings. And then it says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it. And was glad. Now, boom. This right here is what triggered them. He says, your father Abraham was glad to see my day. Now, if someone told you that, like, hey, your your grandfather was happy to see see my day, you'd be like, you know my grandfather? How you know that? Then Jesus says this. Then said the Jews unto him, thou art not yet 50 years old. Hast thou seen Abraham? So they're like, look, you're not even 50 years old. Maybe if you were 3,000 years old, 4,000, you perhaps see Abraham. But then Jesus says this to just cast out all doubt of who he, who he claims to be. He says, and Jesus said unto him, verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. So let's say Abraham is here in this timeline. Jesus is right here talking to the the Pharisees. He says, before Abraham was, I am. Now, he didn't say before Abraham was, I was. He could say that because he was before Abraham too. Or he didn't say before Abraham was, I will be. But before Abraham was, I am. In other words, he is presently with Abraham today. So just like God on the high end, he is everywhere. The great I am throughout all time. Like omnipresent, not just in space, but also in time. You ever prayed and thought like, God? Are you listening to me? I mean, there's like a billion people talking to you at the same time. <laughs> like, how is it that you talk to me as though I'm the only person here? See, what God has the ability to do, he has the ability to be here with you as though he's not anywhere else. And he closed off all that he is everywhere else, but he's all there too, but he can be here in time and space with you. Now, thank you guys for the illustration. Considering that God does this, he, he's going back and forth in time, and he's walking with us in time and so on. This is the majesty of it. Now, I'm going to tell you this amazing thing. Because Jesus is the omega, this, this would mean this is, okay, let's say this is, uh, this is A.D., B.C. So B.C. is that's, that way, and A.D. is this way. So this is after the cross, correct? So after the cross, Jesus had scars, correct? So here, when we get to heaven, we will see Jesus, and he will have those scars, those prints in his hands. But did you know that Jesus had scars in his hands before he became a man? Did you know that? Okay, let me show you. Now, it, 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 it may read a little better in, in the New King James Version, but turn with me to Habakkuk. Habakkuk 3, verse 4, talking about God. He says, and his brightness was as the light, and he had horns coming out of his hand, and there was the, and there was the hiding of his power. Okay, now... In other translations, they they translate it as light beams. So you have God. He sees God, and in his hands are light beams coming out of his hands. 
I don't think it's a coincidence that the place that shows the most power is the place he was nailed. He is glowing with all this power and so on. But the thing is this. Because it, this was not something that happened, uh, 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 this, is, this is not a sight that, that they saw after the cross. Any creature, any angel that saw Jesus in heaven before this, they wouldn't recognize it as wounds. They just thought, oh, that's just where his power comes from. But this was the evidence of what he will go through and what he has gone through for all eternity. Now, let me, let me show you even more. Turn with me to Genesis, Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Is it making sense so far? Okay, okay, Genesis chapter 3. Now, this is after Adam and Eve sinned, and then so on. He tells them that he's going to give them coats of skin. So let's start from verse 21. And it says, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord make coats of skin and clothed them. And it says, And the Lord God said, Behold, Man has become as one of us to know good and evil. Now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Or let's, yeah, so let's keep him from taking from the tree of life. So notice this. God confesses that man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now, There's two kinds of knowledge in the Bible. There's the experiential knowledge where you experience it, and then you kind of know it through the experience, or just the cognitive knowledge where you just kind of know it in your mind. So when Adam and Eve sinned, and they they took of the tree of good, the knowledge of good and evil, did they just know it, just know about evil? No, I mean, God told them, do not eat of this. So they knew, okay, that's evil. Don't do that. They knew that cognitively. But when they sinned or when they transgressed and felt the guilt of sin on them, guess what happened? Then their eyes would open. Then they knew. So when they sinned, that was experiential knowledge. In other words, they experienced just like how later on in, in, in the Bible you find that Adam knew his wife. He didn't just know about her, just talk to her and so on. He sexually knew her. So, here, when God said man had become like one of us, knowing good and evil, do you think this is just a cognitive or experiential? Experiential. Get this. I want you to, emph- real, I want you to notice the, the, the phrase, one of us. Now, when he says us, when God is speaking about us, who is he talking about? Talking about the angels? Or are you talking about himself? There's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Tell me, which one of these experienced evil? Which one of these became sin for us? Which one of these actually took the sin of the world and was crucified for us and knew the, uh, knew the pains of sin and knew evil. It was Jesus. It was not the Father that went through the cross. It was not the Holy Spirit, but it was Jesus. So imagine this. Adam sinned, and then Jesus is there with his hands glowing with power. And as, he's glow- as his hand is glowing with power, he says to himself, he says, man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And Adam sees that, and he hears that, and it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense for us for thousands and thousands of years. This is deeper than the Matrix. <laughs> this is deeper than any movie concept. This is so deep that God, he is standing there with the wounds of the future, 
and the angels did not understand it. It was something they desired to look into because the evidence of God's love was all the way from the beginning. So Jesus, he was like, look, man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And his hands were showing, hey, this did not catch me by surprise. <laughs> this is, it's not like I, didn't, I wasn't the preparation for this. So get this. Did Jesus become the solution? Did Jesus become the Savior? He was always the Savior. Jesus was always good. He did not become good. Was, he, Jesus did not become the Creator. He was always the Creator from eternity past. So there was never a time that the Father can look to the Son and say, oh, you're not a savior. You're not good yet. No. He was always good. He was always who he was and who he is today. So we can never look to the past and say, okay, God, you've grown a lot today. You, you've, you've become a really good person today. I mean, when you came down and died for us, that was amazing. I mean, you have really matured. God doesn't mature. He was always that way. He was always our Savior from the very beginning. That's why when we go to Revelation 13, verse 8, it says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names were not written in the book of life, of the Lamb slain from the when? From the foundation of the earth. So when we see the cross, yes, Jesus was historically crucified on the cross, but yet it was also true because he was crucified in time, he was also slain from the very beginning of, the, of time. It was, it, to God, it makes no difference. He is, he's the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. That's why, you know, we can talk about God in so many different ways. Like, it's not either this or that. He's both and above that. So the amazing thing about this is that what God does, when he came down and died for us, he's up here from the now dimension, just doing all this, <laughs> so on, going back in time. I mean, it would just make our heads spin and our brains just explode. And then also, and he comes down and limits himself just to a small little fetus. And as he's there, just kind of just floating in the, the world of his mother's, the mother's womb, and eventually comes out, everyone gets to watch God without all this power. See, Satan's accusation was not just, hey, God, you're a bad guy. It's, God, you're not good all the time. You're not loving all the time. You're not the same all the time. You are arbitrary. You just make things up and then expect us to just do it because you are a dictator and no one can really trust you with the future. So what God did to make provision for any future accusation, any kind of accusation, he became like one of us without all the power, all the pump, all everything. And as he's coming out the mother's womb, and he's just there with blurry vision, looking at things, and he has to figure out who's who. I mean, the angels are just there looking at this weird spectacle, and they're like, they have to, I can imagine, they have to really question each other, like, is, is this really God, though? Really? And they're watching him, like, learn how to walk and so on, and talk and do everything, because remember one of Satan's accusation about another person that was perfect, Job? Satan said, he don't serve you for no reason. He serves you because you bless him. Look, there's a hedge around him. And if, I, if you just take that hedge away from him, I bet he, and, just, and let me get to him, I bet he will curse you to your face. So, you think that demons just stopped that with that one argument? 
No, no, no. They go on and on and on. And they accuse Jesus of the same thing. Oh, it's easy for you to say all those things standing on the throne with, you know, flaming cherubim surrounding you. You would curse your father in the face. You would just hate everyone and just destroy everyone if you became a man like one of them. You can't blame them or judge them. So he comes down and he just takes away all the hedges. He takes away all the dimensional powers. He takes away just even his omniscience. And he walks like you and I. Now, you ever heard the phrase, you cannot walk a mile in my shoes? Basically, you're just saying, look, if you were like me, you would fail. I'm actually better than you because I'm actually going with, with my shoes. But what Jesus did, he took off all his glorious shoes and he put on our stink shoes and walked in it. And he passed every exam with every deficiency that we can possibly have. And for God, you may say, oh, no, God, did, Jesus, it was a little easier for him. I mean, he was taken care of by a good family and so on. But no, no, no. It was far more hard than Jesus. He doesn't have to hear your mouth. You're going to say, that's wrong. He's a Sorry. I wiped your memory off. He doesn't have to go through all that. He literally can actually, if he's going through temptations in the desert, he could turn the stone into, into to, to bread, as Satan wanted him to do. He could just morph the stars and just do whatever he wanted. But he did not. That's why his temptations was far higher than any of us. We think we're being tempted because we're weak. No. It's, it's great temptation when you're hungry and you have the power to turn anything into food. <laughs> Man, anything. Like, I, I've, I fasted one time for, like, four days. And I was, like, you know, in the, in the, in the uh, um, like, this biology trail back in southern. You know, there's, you know, this nice tree area. And I'm there trying to meditate. And as I'm there, I'm looking at this tree. And I saw, like, the, the bark just kind of wet and brown and chocolatey and, oh, it was just looking tasty. And I'm just thinking, oh, man. Woo, I, w- I sure wish I had the power to just, just turn that into chocolate right now. And, uh, you know, as I was there, I'm just thinking, oh, my goodness, Jesus. It must have been extremely hard for you because you had the power to turn anything into food. I mean, pretty much every house would be a cookie house to you. You don't have to go, you don't have to walk with these rules, but you are literally playing with our rules, just walking in it. So that's, that's the amazing thing about, you find, about the God of Scripture. He plays three roles of high-dimensional authority, and he's good in all of them. So that goes to show that God, if God if God was a lamb, he would die for you. If God was a dog, he would die for you. If God was, you know, a, an elephant, he would die for you. He would do anything to save you. But the best language that you can understand is a man. So he, died, he became a man, walked among us, and he taught us that he was always with us. That's why the Bible says, what shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness? <laughs> no, and all these things were more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither depth nor height nor, nor um, angels nor powers nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because his love, he loved us with an everlasting love. So just picture this. All the way from he- here... From the very beginning, he has this love for you that is so strong, it's just so powerful, that he starts creating you. And as he creates you and so on, he provides a place for you in time. Now, get this. I want you to turn with me to Zechariah. Zechariah 13, verse, verse 6. 
this, I believe, is speaking about Jesus. And it says, And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in your hands? Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. So in other words, this is someone in heaven, eventually in the future, that would ask Jesus, Hey, wh- what are these wounds in your hands? Because there's going to be lots of people who have not heard the gospel, have not seen, uh, like, for, like in their time, Jesus did not come yet. So the story of the cross and all those things, it just did not register in their mind yet. So they come up to heaven and they, they hear about, you know, this wonderful man who was God and so on. And then they see him and then they see these scars. And they're like, what's, what's, why do you have these scars? No one else here has scars except you, the king of kings. Why, why, what happened? And then he would say, well, these are the wounds that I found, you know, in the house of a friend. Question. You ever wondered why Jesus' scars never heal? You ever wonder why his scars remain? It's because of this. One, for all eternity in the future, we will never sin again because his evidence would be the reason. His, I mean, his, his hands would be the evidence and the reason for us to not sin ever again. That's one thing. And then two, he's always there at the cross. You might be wondering, what, what, what do you mean? See, the Bible tells us that eventually we will not remember the things that have, that have gone to pass. Like, we will forget those things. But Jesus, Jesus will always remember you. If a person is lost... He will always remember you. That's why the Bible tells us, he says, can a woman forget the child of her womb? They may forget, but I will never forget. That's why he would rather you be alive one second in the world than for you to not exist at all. That's why God hates abortion. That's why God hates the the idea of you not being born at all. The idea that you existed once is a scar in his hands forever. He will always love you. And that is the reason why his scars never heal. Is because he's always loving you throughout all time. Now, it'll be a waste. It'll be a waste if you just live this whole entire existence knowing that he carries your memory throughout all eternity and you're not there living it with him. You know, the Bible says that God will wipe away all our tears away. But who is big enough to wipe away God's tears? No one. But you can make him happy by being there for him. You can make him happy. You don't want him to cry over your grave forever. (laughs) He loves you that much that he would actually go in time and look for you and find you. It doesn't matter where you are in in your life. God sees it. He knows it. But as far as now, he wants you to come to him today. He loves you that much. God's love is so deep that he will cut through time just to save you. And that's why he gave us the Sabbath. Have us time or a place in time so that we can meditate on his power and also the time he took to save us.